If you want to learn how to gain insights you can act on and solve business problems with data, all while building a data-driven culture at your organization, sign up for Pragmatic Institute's new course, Data Science for Business Leaders. Find out more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. Welcome to Data Chats, a podcast by Pragmatic Institute and the Data Incubator, where we tackle data topics and trends with experts, industry leaders, instructors, and alumni. I'm your host, Chris Richardson, and today I'm sitting down with Ali Torman, information design consultant and host of the Data Viz Today podcast. Ali, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm happy to be talking to you today, and I guess let's start off for the audience Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background. Oh, yeah, sure. So going back to college, I was a math major and I got a nice boring job <laughs> as a systems analyst for a government clients in the D.C. area. So like the FBI, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I was running a lot of SQL queries, testing software, and I always kind of felt like there was something creative missing from my day to day. So I actually went back to school and got a graduate certificate in geospatial intelligence, thinking I could do mapping type things. And that would mm -hmm. scratch the creative itch. But then I started having kids and I took maternity leave and stopped working for a little while. But during that time, I discovered that data visualization is an entire field <laughs> and career. So I started my own podcast called Data Viz Today. And as a kind of an excuse to interview data viz designers yeah. and learn what tools they were using, their process. And, you know, four years later, it's, I'm still, still going with it. And in between that, I got a job as a data viz designer and then last year launched into my own independent studio. So now I work with big companies, small companies, creating graphics ranging from traditional dashboards to illustrations and comics, all just trying to convey information in the most engaging way possible. Yeah, no, I mean, there's so much about that and congratulations on opening that. And it's ripe for conversation for the people listening today because I'm sure we have some data viz people, but I also know that we have a lot of people who are using data viz. Probably everyone listening mm -hmm. use it, if not creates data viz. And I think there's a, it's often, people who don't have formal training, but you can look at a chart and understand either this is really well constructed or this isn't, but it's hard to put that into words sometimes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we can start off by saying a few things about what data strives to be, data viz strives to be, and where you see often there's room for improvement with people who are starting to think about this as, as seriously as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the biggest part that I have found that will make your visualizations, like you said, like they look intentional, is to start with some sort of brief of some sort where you're thinking about who your audience is and what you're trying to achieve with your graphic. What is the one thing you want your audience to take away? If you're not thinking about that, then you're just going to dive into it in Excel yeah. and you're going to press whatever button. Too, yeah. <laughs> you press whatever button comes first, go with the default. And what are you really measuring it against? When, whatever Excel gives you, how are you deciding if that's good or not? If you don't start with some sort of brief, some document of what you want your audience to feel, what you want them to take away, what you want them to do with the information. If you're not thinking about that ahead of time, you're just going to let the software take you wherever. And I think that's what you're seeing when you mm -hmm. see the graphics that work and the ones that don't work. The ones that work are ones where people thought of that ahead of time or the, or by accident. <laughs> it just yeah. happened to work out. Yeah. And you, I mean, you're someone who obviously has thought a lot about this and has a lot of experience. So I wonder if you can take us through a little bit of that journey. I mean, you already highlighted some of your background and I wonder how that played a role in what you're doing now. Like what did, what did you take in terms of knowledge to get you towards where you are today? Yeah, that's a great question. I think being a software tester really helped me realize that if you don't have any kind of metrics ahead of time when you, before you start building something, then 
you don't really know how to test it to see if it worked, right? Like at the mm -hmm. beginning of a software cycle, you are saying, okay, this, you need to have a button that does this. It needs to show the user this, and then they need to be able to do this. And then yeah. I can write test scripts. And after someone has developed it, I can't go through my test scripts, be like, okay, do we have this button? Did it give me this? Check it off, check it off, check it off. If I didn't do that ahead of time, then I'm not going to, I mean, who's to say whether the software is working as intended, right? <laughs> we didn't uh -huh. document it. And so when I first started creating visualizations, I was not applying that thought process to my visualizations. And one example is I, when I first started dabbling in freelancing, when I had a job, this survey company approached me asking me if I could create a visualization of their survey results and they wanted something cool they could put on a t-shirt in addition to their website. I thought, oh, great. You know, some, that sounds like data art, right? Like I would love to do some cool data art type thing. So I just took that one line brief and then I went into my cave and <laughs> I started designing and I designed something really cool. It's like this tessellated unit chart type thing. And then I presented it to them just like fully fleshed out. I didn't send them sketches. I didn't send them concepts. I sent them something completely fleshed out and done. I was like, there you go. And they, as you can imagine, they were just like, that's nice, but not anything what we were thinking. <laughs> we actually kind of wanted something that the user would be able to like filter something by and, you know, something more based on data <laughs> rather than data art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of had this light bulb moment. Oh, yeah. Maybe I should have asked them a few more questions before I just started designing something. And then I went back to my software testing training. Like, okay, I'm going to have to ask some questions, really nail down their audience. Where exactly is this visualization going? Who's going to see it? How much time are they going to spend with it? I need to nail that stuff ahead of time. Otherwise, I don't know which design decisions to make along the way. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's clearly something someone as a design consultant or a visualization expert can do for an organization. I wonder when it becomes appropriate to, as an organization to think about hiring a consultant, like what kind of projects do you see that are maybe like the small, medium and large kinds of projects a data viz expert can do mm -hmm. either internally or externally if they're hiring someone? Yeah. So a smaller project, one that I worked on recently, a company had this main infographic that they have on their website, on their about page. And then also when they're talking to their clients, they're constantly using this one infographic that explains their process of how companies work with them. And the one they had before, you know, an intern had made it and, you know, had put a bunch of icons and people were not understanding it. So a lot of times when you hear over and over again, this graphic is not explaining what we need it to explain. People just aren't understanding it. That's kind of on the small end of projects that I come in and I'll help them redesign a small infographic type thing. Medium sized projects, I would say maybe like a presentation deck where you want to tell a data story. Like here's where we came from. This is our trajectory. This is where we're going. And then the bigger size projects, I wrapped one up earlier this year for a government client where they had were redesigning an entire dashboard. So it had four different charts that worked together, like a map and a line chart and a dumbbell chart. And so the user would be able to filter information, you know, drill down to their state, down to their county, and see how jobs were shaking out there. So yeah, that's kind of like the small, medium, and large of consulting projects that I've worked on. Yeah. And when you put that together, what does that typically look like for people who are maybe either thinking about hiring and so what should they expect, but also maybe people thinking about doing this kind of work, what should they expect to provide? I mean, I guess you would have some kind of brief, do you have standard, mm -hmm. you know, different kinds or is there one setup that you tend to go towards? What does it look like when you're working with a client like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I start with one brief, but there are some sections that I might skip depending on what exactly the project is. You know, if it's more mm -hmm. of a data art project, I might not need one section or if it's a dashboard, I might not need so much art direction in the section. But typically the whole process is someone comes to me, maybe they send me an email or fill out the form on my website just saying, hey, I think we need some help with X, Y, and Z. And we have a discovery call to see if we're a good fit. 
If yes, then we do a contract. And then I do a kickoff call where I'm going through my questionnaire for my data viz brief, which I'll get back to I'm talking about goals, audience, all that. After that, then I'll do data exploration, go through any information that they provide. Then I'll create prototypes and then get feedback, rounds of feedback on them. And then I'll clean up the prototype and deliver it in whatever like high fidelity format we've talked about. So if it's something static, you know, I'm working in Adobe Illustrator or Figma. If it's something more interactive, then maybe it's a Figma prototype or using Tableau, another off the shelf tool. And then yeah, deliver the final files. So that's kind of my overall process. And then when I'm doing the kickoff call, I'm going through my questionnaire for the date of his brief. And generally it has about five different sections where we have the general project details. So what mm -hmm. is this project? Why are you doing this project now? What's your timeline? Who needs to approve the final graphic? What's the goal for the project? Questions like, how will we know we're successful? Try to dig into the metrics as much as possible because sometimes people haven't exactly thought of what the success criteria would look like. And mm -hmm. typically, it's kind of my... My favorite thing to talk about, because it is really hard to quantify what makes a visualization successful, right? But typically, people are thinking about uh, maybe like four different things, like if how well people are understanding the information. So if I show this person a graphic, can they read it and then regurgitate back to me what it's saying? Oh, yeah, sales went up by 25% this year. Okay, ahead of time, I need to note that's what I want people to be able to say. If you yeah. haven't thought about that, again, <laughs> you can't determine whether the visualization was successful or not. So testing understanding, a memorability. Can someone look at this visual, understand it, and be able to tell another person later on, explain to them the process or what happened? They need to be able to read it and remember the takeaway. Sometimes we're testing for time. Like, I want someone to be able to see this visualization and really quickly get the information mm -hmm. that they want. And I feel like sometimes that's a misconception about visualization, that it always needs to be fast. People always need to see something and very quickly get the answer. And that's not always the case. Sometimes we want people to take the time and read it or change the filters, interact with it. So sometimes faster isn't better, but like I said, defining that ahead of time is something you should think about. So testing for time, how fast someone gets the information. And then also another metric could be how eye-catching or engaging a visual is. Sometimes people don't care about that, but sometimes it's really important. And we need this visual to catch someone's attention and we need them to click on the graphic on Twitter, right? <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. engagement is really important to you. And depending on what your metric is, I'm going to focus on different things and I'm mm -hmm. going to design different ways. So we can dive more into that if you want, but that that's more like project details section. Then we're talking about the audience, specific data constraints, where the data is coming from. When's it going to be ready? Sometimes mm -hmm. people say the re data is ready, but then it's not. What format mm -hmm. is it in? Design specifications. So if you have some sort of brand guidelines, be ready to show the designer, mm -hmm. data viz designer, any kind of brand guidelines you have what format it should be in. Is this going to be in presentations? Is it on the website? Do you expect interactivity? Is it going to be static? And then art direction too. How do you want your audience to feel when they see the visualization? Do you want it to look more artsy or do you want it to look more serious, business-like? Those kind of words can help the designer kind of bring to fruition your vision of the visualization. So those are kind of the main segments that I'm running through when I'm trying to nail down the brief. Yeah. I mean, there's lots to dig into there. Mm -hmm. uh, but my first question is, when you're talking about testing to see whether people can remember something a little mm -hmm. bit later or whether they can retell the narrative or the data the way that you are hoping, I'm curious if you actually, do you plan on that and then you hand it over or do you actually test it with numbers and do some kind of, I don't know, survey or, or audience research or what, what do you typically do? to assess the success of that, especially before, like if you're preparing for a presentation that somebody's going to do, I would imagine that, you know, it would be great to do it afterwards, but you want to do something ahead of time too. So I'd be curious about that process. Yeah. So if my client has 
a test group that I can work with. That's always the best case scenario, but it's pretty mm. rare that they do have somebody that I can use because usually everyone in the company is aware of the information. They just have, they already know, you know, what's yeah. happening. So if you want to test true memorability, you know, you need some fresh eyes. So I actually use a website called usabilityhub.com mm. and it's paid, but you can set up all sorts of design tests, upload an image, or you can upload a Figma prototype link if it's something that someone has to interact with and ask them certain questions. So you can have a five second test where you show the visualization for five seconds and then it takes it away and it asks a question. So if you're thinking about a time aspect, like we need people to at a glance know exactly what they're taking away. That's a good test. Another test I do is put the visualization in front of them. And then right next, I'll ask them some questions like, what do you think this graphic is showing? Mm -hmm. Or why do you think X, Y, and Z? Like, see if they are doing the takeaway action that I want them to do. And I have found that doing the open-ended questions is the best. <laughs> One, because, you know, you never, since you're not seeing these people, they could just be checking a box, A, yeah. B, or C, and, you know, not even trying. You can't really tell. But if it's open-ended question, you can actually really see, did they get this? Maybe you're providing a lot of context, or maybe you're, you're not. I like to provide as little context as possible, because a lot of times people are really busy, and maybe they didn't mm -hmm. read the title very carefully, you know, or maybe they didn't read the subtitle. And I think you'll find that a lot of people don't even bother reading the title or subtitle. So your visualization has to do a lot of heavy lifting. So yeah. being able to just quickly test what someone took away without any kind of context is really helpful. And one project I did over the summer, we were trying to see if he had one info, my client had one infographic, and then I redesigned it. And we were trying to see if I improved understanding. <laughs> so we asked 20 people on the original graphic. So it's good to have a baseline. As of our baseline, we asked them, we asked about 20 people, what do you think this graphic is saying? And about 20% of people were kind of on the right track. My client and I both scored them, scored the answers like, does this person seem like they're on the right track or not? About 20% of people said that they were on the right track. And then with my new graphic, we tested them again, no context, and the people were about 75% on track. So that was a pretty good, it was only 20 people each, but these were separate, you know, these are different people, but that's mm -hmm. a pretty big, pretty big improvement. And it gave us a lot of good information like, yeah, this is, this is on the right track. Yeah, well, and that's what I was going to ask about next is, what do you typically aim for? I mean, I know in certain data science projects, people are looking for like 99.99%. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what is a realistic goal if you're doing something like that, where you're, you're hoping people will take away the understanding that you want? What do you, what do you typically aim for if you're testing that? It really depends on the client. So the one I just said, he said, if we could get one more person <laughs> than I currently have, it will, this project will have been worth it to me. So I hate, I know that's kind of a cop out answer, but mm. it really depends on the person and how much money they're investing in this process. If you're not investing a lot of money, you know, you're just one extra person, you know, is a benefit or maybe this is a hundred thousand dollar project. You're like, I'm going to need 99% of people getting this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you also have to account for just natural error in the testing thing. So if something was above 90%, I would either be suspicious or I would already know, like, this is a super straightforward concept and we probably didn't even need to test it anyway. So hmm. if you're in, I have found 70 to 90, if you're in there, you're doing really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, part of it, I guess, is the understanding that you set up ahead of time. I mean, you mentioned how you would go through that process, mm -hmm. work with stakeholders. I mean, you outlined it so nicely. And I just know from experience that it's great to have these outlines, but a stakeholder or some something in the organization is always going to go amiss. So I wonder if you have guidance for how to work with stakeholders. What are common issues? Even if you have the best laid plans, what is more likely to go wrong and how do you deal with those? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. So a big spot where we go wrong is they try to bring in more stakeholders in the middle or towards the end. And okay. that can make a project take forever. And, you know, when you're in a company, I understand you don't have 
you don't have any say really to be like, oh, you can't bring in that stakeholder at this phase. Yeah. <laughs> you can't really say that, right? So the way that I combat that is at the beginning of every presentation, uh, every concept presentation, like I've done some sketches or we're doing another round of revisions. Every time I'm presenting, I start with the goal, the audience, uh, the goal, the audience and our success criteria. So our main goal was to be able to communicate X, Y, and Z to this, to this audience. And our audience is people, CEOs at this company or something. Mm -hmm. So we have the goal, the audience and our success criteria. Our success criteria is that we need this audience to be able to get this takeaway in under 10 seconds. So right before I'm presenting my next round of revisions, I'm reminding everybody, this is what we already agreed upon. Yeah. And then when people are giving me feedback, they've already been primed for me to make the argument. Yeah, that would be a really great change or edit, but we had already decided this was our success criteria. This is, you know, our benchmark. What you're suggesting takes us off track. Do we want to go off track at this point? I mean, for me as an independent consultant, if we're going off track, then we have to change the scope with, you know, as an employee, that might not be the case, but you still need to make the point that we're kind of starting over here if we're changing it at this point. So defining those things at the beginning, super important. Everybody's on the same page, but then you should bring it up every time you are going over your concepts and it kind of can seem repetitive (laughs) and it might seem silly to be pasting that into every email or Mm. to be talking about it at the beginning of every presentation. People are like, yeah, we already know, (laughs) but really it's really important to do it and I never skip it. And then I'm also tying all my design decisions to pieces from the brief because some people might say, oh, why did you choose that color? Or why did you show this? And I can easily pull out the brief and say, well, we chose yellow is because we wanted, it's part A, part of your brand, and B, we wanted people to feel X emotion when they see it or something. So Mm -hmm. anytime you can tie your design decisions to the brief that your stakeholders already signed off on, it makes that process way faster. The feedback becomes way more constructive. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend in design who says something like, if I like when starting off a project, I say you can do one round of revisions or whatever they agree to. If you want to change things after that round, it's a new project. Hmm. We start from scratch, basically. And I wonder if you have any kind of rule for how much you can go back and forth or how to guide that process, because I know it can become just, yeah, adding on more and more and more. And then it just, you know, it's a never ending thing. Yeah. In my contract, I have that once we leave the sketch phase, there's only three rounds of revisions after that. And I have found that to be really helpful in getting people to decide, okay, we are committing to this way forward. And the fact that I spend so much time in the sketch phase, that really helps prevent me having to reinvent the wheel if there's some other change down the line. Where I have gotten into trouble is when I, like I told you, like when I just completely skip the the sketch phase, when you you skip it, then there's problems. But if I don't spend enough time on the sketch phase, and maybe we didn't make sure all the stakeholders saw everything in the sketch phase, then I can expect to have problems when I'm polishing it up and I'm showing them the final graphic. I can expect them there to be a lot of revisions at the end. But having a very robust sketch concept phase has been really helpful to me. And I am talking about like actually literally sketch hand sketching it, which Mm -hmm. is really great for people to see. It makes them kind of step back and not focus on all the details that you haven't put in there yet. So whenever Mm -hmm. you use any kind of software program, it's going to automatically look some level of polished and people, even when I sketch things, sometimes people think, is this done? <laughs> I try to make it as obviously as possible. But, you know, you can see how if you use the software, people think, oh, are you done? But I have found used actually literally hand sketching things. Even if I prototype things in a software, I'll actually bring it back out and hand sketch it 
when I'm in the sketch phase to show my client because I don't want them to get hung up on the details of the execution part. Right now, we're just talking about, you know, is this chart type, does this chart type work for this data for what we're trying to achieve? So really spending a lot of time in the sketch phase, that saved me a lot of a lot of back and forth. Yeah, well, that makes me uh, curious about your, your tools. I mean, you've already mentioned a few softwares and it sounds like you're literally using a, do you use a pen and pencil or do you use, uh, what, what are you using for sketching? Are you sketching on the computer? I use pen and pencil when I, pen, pen, pencil, paper, <laughs> when I am sketching for myself, when I sketch something to show a client or if I'm doing something more illustration based, I'm actually using my iPad and I have a app on there called Procreate, which is like just a drawing, a drawing app. And it's really flexible and easy to use. And it does look a little bit better than, you know, hand drawings that I scanned in from paper. Sometimes that's a little bit hard to see. So there is a little bit more polish to it using an iPad, but I am using like an actual, I'm using the the iPad pencil and then Mm -hmm. the actual, what they call a brush in Procreate. That one is a pencil. So it looks like I actually did it with pencil. So I'm mimicking it as much as possible. And then as far as data viz tools, I use Tableau a lot. The nice thing about Tableau is I think if you have a license, like for an actual paid license, you can export your chart as SVG. And then that means you can bring it into Adobe Illustrator or Figma and then edit all the elements because it is kind of hard to bring your design to the next level in Tableau, but it's really great for just setting up the bones of a chart. So that's something I do often. I use rawgraphs.io. That's a web-based tool and it's free. You can just paste your, your data in there and download as an image or an SVG as well. And I have found that raw graphs is great when you want to do more of the bespoke chart types. Like if you want to do a Sankey or a Veroni chart, those things are a little bit more custom and you would have to know D3 or something to be able to do it. But if you use rawgraphs.io, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, Figma, Illustrator, more of the design end. And Data Wrapper is a really great tool to use. They have a free a free version and paid version. Free version is still really good. If you want to make something interactive and just looks, looks really sleek and nice, you can also download images flourish.studio is also another good off the shelf type data viz tool. They are really doing really cool innovations with audio storytelling. Like you can Mm. create a series of visualizations and then it'll automatically animate the points for you. And then you can record some sort of audio to narrate your story. So they're doing some cool things in that field. So those are kind of my main tools. Oh yeah. That's a lot of, I think helpful places people can look that we can maybe put some links into Mm -hmm. our show notes as well. So I appreciate that. I wonder, you know, it's interesting that you have uh, the math background and I know that there, I I mean, it's arguable that I've heard that it's not necessarily true that there's these two parts of the brain that are, are so dissimilar, you know, the logic and the creative, but there are definitely people who are feel more comfortable with logic, math, more comfortable with the creative elements. How do you put those two things together? Do you, do you kind of separate it out? I can imagine sketching is more creative. I'm sure dealing with data is more logic based. How do you go back and forth or do you try to put them together? How do they mix in your world? Yeah, this is a really good question. I'm actually writing a book about this <laughs> right Perfect. now. It's, it's about how data people, data practitioners can bring creativity in their lives because it does feel like that a lot of times. And there's really no resource for data practitioners to develop this, what I'm calling a, like a creative practice. And Mm -hmm. that's something that people in the arts, like if you majored in graphic design or in art, that's something that they're taught, you know, they're taught about this ideation phase and sketching concepts and getting feedback and, you know, doing specific rituals and things to be able to get out of creative ruts, how they find inspiration, how they source information, you know, like we're, we're, we don't know anything about this. (laughs) So that's actually something I'm studying. I'm interviewing a lot of people on my podcast. I have this creativity mini series trying to figure out what what data viz practitioners are doing to be more creative. The way that it manifests in my day-to-day, I make sure that I find time in my day to gather inspiration. And so when I am creating a visualization for for my client, I have something to draw from. And Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a really underestimated tool in a data viz practitioner's toolbox. You have to have seen a lot of different solutions in order to find a really great solution for your client in their situation. Because there are so many different variables that go into creating an effective visualization. You have to have seen a lot of things in order to provide your client with a lot of good options. So yeah. and where do you look for that while, while you're talking about that? Where do you look for, for inspiration? Yeah. Other places? Uh, so I have found that the internet is too big. <laughs> so it's so hard. What are you going to do? Just like randomly scroll through the internet? Like it just feels like an impossible task. So what I do is I go to the library every week and I get <laughs> three books, one book where it's some sort of skill related thing. So maybe it might be a data viz book. Maybe it's a graphic design book. Maybe it's an autobiography, you know, something that's more either a skill or giving me a new perspective. And then I go down the arts section or the graphic design section, and I'm getting something visually stimulating, something really beautiful to look at, inspirational in that way. And then the third book is some a wild card. So like, just I'm just walking down the aisle and pick grab something that catches my attention. Or sometimes I go with I go to the library with my two daughters and I'll just grab whatever they checked out from the library as my third book. So like this week I have a comic book that my younger daughter got. And nice. every morning I wake up at six in the morning and between six thirty and seven, I am spending about ten minutes per book. And I'm just flipping through it. Like there's no expectation. I'm not, you know, trying to read every single word. I just look through the book in whatever way, you know, feels right to me. Sometimes it's boring and I'm just like quickly flipping through it. You know, if I'm not really feeling it, sometimes I'm reading every word and I use that book as my inspiration for the next week. You know, it's just mm -hmm. a way to almost in a meditative way, make sure I'm gathering a really diverse set of inspiration. And if you think about it, if you do three books a week like that, you will have gathered inspiration from like 150 books in a year. <laughs> that's a lot of fodder to use in your work. So that's the way that I really like to do it. But I just encourage people to find some sort of ritual, daily ritual of how you gather, gather mm -hmm. inspiration. And then yeah, when how do you integrate the the more logic math stuff? Or do you maybe, I mean, how much of that do you do now? I'm not, I don't do much analysis nowadays since I have focused more on the visualization. I'm coming in more towards the end of the project where people have already figured out what they want to say most for the okay. most part. And I'm just trying to find the best way to visualize it. So I'm not doing as much analysis, but you know, I'm doing a lot of data cleaning and reshaping of data and making calculations to make the visualization do what I want it to do. But I see that more as the ex in the execution phase. So I'm using more of the creative brain at the beginning when I'm gathering inspiration, when I'm sketching concepts, and then I switch into execution. And I, that's more of the problem solving and actually clicking the buttons and, you know, dragging the variables and, you know, doing it, doing that. And then not to say that doing that kind of thing doesn't require creativity because creativity is you know, mm -hmm. you can define it any all sorts of ways, but really it's just finding a new solution that has some sort of, that serves some sort of practical purpose or fulfills some sort of need, right? That's kind of how I define it. So when you're trying to figure out why this calculation doesn't work, <laughs> that you, that could really use some creativity and figuring out mm, yeah. why, why it doesn't work. So, but I do find my logical brain comes more later in the process when I'm executing a project. Yeah. And in, so in the experience and in all of this inspiration that you've been gathering, are there ways of presenting data that you no longer go towards or maybe that you're doing more of now? I know some people, for example, like hate pie charts. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you do now that you didn't do before or that you stopped doing now with, with this experience that you have now? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think I've probably become more open-minded is, is the, okay. the, the biggest thing I did feel when you first, when you're kind of like on the outside of the field, you kind of hear the loudest voices. So mm -hmm. you hear the people saying, never use a pie chart, data to ink ratio, you know, you hear those things, right? <laughs> but when you're more in the field and you're doing more experimentation, you're seeing how things, people react to different things. You're seeing all the different use cases of different graphics. So like 
everything from the traditional dashboard to a comic I've done. And those have completely different audiences, completely different use cases. So if someone comes to me and says, don't do a pie chart, don't do a illustration, don't do a comic, don't do a dashboard, you know, like it just doesn't make any sense because I've seen great applications for all these things. So I think my advice would just be don't box yourself in to what you've heard, some dogma that you've heard from someone else or one particular book or just because Excel doesn't have this chart type as one of its defaults doesn't mean it's not a good chart to use. Mm-hmm. Some, maybe for one particular use case, it is it is the best chart or vice versa. Like just because uh, Excel has the pie chart option doesn't mean you should always be clicking it. <laughs> there yeah. are cases where it's not, not going to be the best choice. So yeah, I think the more experienced I've gotten, the more open-minded I've gotten. What about trends that you've seen? Are, you, are there things that you think maybe are just, even if they were good, are simply overdone? Or Mm. things that are starting to appear that you think are interesting that are going to gain traction in the future? So you probably have seen a lot of the what they call scrolly telling, where you're scrolling Mm. through a web page and like the chart is moving around. And I kind of feel like, like, yeah, yeah, I kind of feel like that's reaching its peak. It became it's super trendy. I personally don't like it because it kind of makes me feel dizzy. (laughs) I feel (laughs) like a lot of people are feel the same and they're just starting to speak up. But I I feel like that's sort of reaching its peak. It might have the trend maybe kind of fizzling out at this point. Looking to the future, I'm kind of seeing a beginning of sonification where they're Hmm. taking data and sonifying it. And there's a lot of accessibility uh, considerations. Like if you have a chart and maybe it's animated and it's like showing a trend going up and you also hear along with it, like a pitch going up at the same time, it's very accessible to someone with vision issues. So there's a lot of accessibility things, but there's also a lot of ways that you can use sound to kind of build a whole experience around data. So if you are listening to something, you know, from a podcast, hearing someone's voice, like there's a whole nother layer of information you can get than if you were just reading this interview as a blog post. So you can get a lot of emotion that you wouldn't be able to get from a visual by incorporating sound. So I think people are trying to actually bringing another sense into data visualization, Hmm. which is really exciting. Yeah, that is. I mean, it's interesting. Or do you have any examples that you've seen of that kind of thing working out or like working to do that? Yeah, for sure. Go to check out the Loud Numbers podcast. So if you listen to this, you like podcasts, check out (laughs) Loud Numbers. Duncan Gear and Miriam Quick are both data visualization practitioners, but also are really into sonification and sonifying data. And both of them are journalists too. So each episode is about like usually something climate related. And it's, they have this whole storytelling journey, but they've put data and they've sonified it, but also made it sound like music, which is really cool. So I would highly recommend that podcast. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I suppose for people who are thinking about, say, bringing in a consultant, what do you encourage them to think about ahead of time? Are there things that you, you think are good to get out or to discuss before someone like you is brought in? Or maybe the first step is to ask you to come in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sometimes I am brought in to help go through this whole my data mm-hmm. brief process. And even me asking these questions and knowing which questions to ask is really helpful. But you know, you can save some money if you already know yeah. that stuff ahead of time. Or if you at a minimum, what really, really helps me is if you just have one main goal for the project, you know who you're talking to, and what your success criteria is. I mean, mm that's really going to put you head and shoulders among everybody else. And it's going to make the project so painless, so, so much nicer. And I can just dive into the ideas and be showing you a lot of cool ideas. And we're not going round and round, you know, me having to talk to everybody internally. And we're just like running in circles about what, what the actual goal of this project is, (laughs) you know, if you can do that ahead of time that that would be really helpful. And I will actually provide you a link to my database questionnaire that people can download in the show notes. And so people can just work internally on this and use it for their teams, use it to basically interview your stakeholders to get yourself ready for a project. I mean, it's really useful to to try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Great. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot to think about. And I think more and more people, more and more organizations are realizing how 
important data viz is to their work and to what they're producing. So I wonder for people listening, what would you recommend they start doing maybe today or tomorrow at least, like within the next 24 hours, what are two things that they could start doing to improve their data viz, whether that's reading and interpreting or whether that's creating? What are some things that they could start doing right away to have an impact? I would say, first thing, download the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if you want to practice with it and you don't have a project that you could use it on right now, go back and look at one of your previous projects, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe uh, the current dashboard that you guys have that you use every day and answer the questions from the questionnaire on that dashboard. And you will, I guarantee you that you're going to realize, actually, maybe we should do this kind of thing, or maybe we need, we actually don't need this chart. This isn't serving us. You know, you're going to have a fresh perspective on it. So download the questionnaire and either use it on your current project. You're just about to start or go and I answer those questions on something that you already have. And it's going to, it's going to really change your perspective. Excellent. And I mean, you've given us a bunch of great things to check out that I'm excited to do. I've been taking notes, but for people who want to follow you or to see what you've been up to, where should they check you out? Yeah, go to AllieTorban.com, A-L-L-I-T-O-R-B-A-N. And you can see links to my work if you want to hire me and also to my podcast. If you're into data viz, I have over 80 episodes all about nerding mm-hmm. out about visualization. So I'd love to have you join me on there. Excellent. Are you on social media or anything? Oh, yeah. Twitter, Ali Torben, LinkedIn, Ali Torben, Ali Torben everywhere. And I'm <laughs> literally the only Ali Torben on, in the world. That helps. So <laughs> that helps. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than being Chris Richardson, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I was Allison Johnson before I got married. So I think I had you beat on the. <laughs> Well, that's great. No, and and it is wonderful to be able to see to check out your work and to hear you geeking out about this kind of stuff because your podcast is really entertaining as well, as well as being informative. Mm-hmm. So it's been great talking to you and learning a little bit more about what you do and uh, data viz more generally. So Ali, I have to say thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. 